It's the early 2000s. The tuna scene is in full swing in the public eye, and every racing and developer wants a piece of that pie. Two titans among all others, Midnight Club and Need for Speed. Midnight Club, developed by Angel Studios and published by Rockstar Games in late 2000, latched onto the tuna scene early. In addition to the heavily modified vehicles, the game also allowed players to race through the railroad cities of New York and London. On top of that, the game featured multiple named opponents, each with their own unique vehicle type and driving style, adding more character what could have easily been just unnamed opponents. Need for Speed, while starting back in 1994, had primarily focused on racing supercars through picturesque backroads. However, in November of 2003, EA would release Need for Speed Underground, replacing the aforementioned supercars and country roads with tuners and gritty urban streets. What set it apart from Midnight Club, however, was the visual and performance tuning available to each and every vehicle, allowing players to make a car truly theirs. It's easy to see why these two rose to the top of the pile, but what if I told you that there was a game that did nearly all of that even earlier? Nineteen ninety nine. A small Japanese game developer known as Genki had been trying to find their niche in the video game market for almost a decade at this point. That's their logo. Isn't it charming? It was drawn by the president's three-year-old son. Genki had been making everything from the breakout-inspired Devilish in 1991 to mech shooters such as Akili Duology in 1995 and 1997, to fighting games such as Fighter's Destiny in 1998. However, it wasn't until they began making racing games that they had found their niche, with their larger success being the Tokyo Extreme Racer games. While I've played many of the other games in the series, I've never gotten a chance to play the original. My first console was a PlayStation 2, and I've never owned a Dreamcast. This review will be using the Redream emulator instead. Now, let's see how well this series set it off. Upon booting the game and coming to the main menu, you're greeted with smooth drum and bass music accompanied by simplistic but stylized menu icons, all of which is subtly highlighted by a darkened map of the Tokyo Expressway in the background. Throughout the game, the menus are easy to navigate while still maintaining a clean and subtle style. As for the vehicles, while they aren't licensed cars, you can pretty easily tell exactly what they are supposed to be, especially because the car models themselves are very high quality for 1999. This is about on par with the vehicle models of the older Gran Turismo games. The detail also extends to the city itself. The traffic vehicles are varied and of decent quality, adding to the immersion when racing on the highway. The highway itself is incredibly detailed, complete with directional signs, safety features, and other markings that make it look like the highway it was based off of. Combined with minimal poppin' for its time, and this game really allows you to feel immersed visually in the world around you. The only complaint I have is that the hood cam feels really weird to play with, almost like it's looking upwards instead of straight ahead. This made driving in the hood cam a very unpleasant experience. Thankfully, the third person view is much better, but if playing in the hood cam is a must for you, then this is already a major strike against the game. As for the sound though, it's a bit more of a mixed bag. The music is really enjoyable, featuring a lot of solid electronic and Eurobeat songs made by Tomoyuki Karamura, specifically for this game. In fact, all of the songs you'll be hearing during this review are from this game, just to give you a taste. However, outside of the music, the game's sound design begins to fall flat. The engine sounds are a single note pitched up or down depending on the RPM you're at. If you have a modified turbocharge engine, you also get a flat turbo wishing sound when applying throttle. Tire sounds are similarly one note. While this may have been acceptable for when the game first came out, it's definitely jarring today. But let's talk about more important matters in this game. The gameplay and story. The Tokyo street racing scene is in full swing, with plenty of racers and teams all vying for the top spot. You are a prospective street racer looking to begin their journey to the top of Tokyo's highway racing scene. With 25,000 credits in your pocket, you set out in a car dealership looking to buy your first car. While plenty of vehicles are available right from the start of the game, including Mazda RX-7s, Toyota Supras, and Nissan Skyline GTRs, you only have enough money for one car from a selection of seven the Toyota Treno 11 AE86, a Honda Civic Type R, an Integra Type R, an S13 Nissan Silvia, an S14 Silvia, and a Nissan 240SX. 
A decent selection with more expensive cars being faster and cheaper options letting you have enough money for upgrades right from the start. Once you buy your first car, you're taken to your home. This is the main menu hub for the career mode. From here we can buy parts and adjust settings on our car, view rival information, and head out onto the highway to race other drivers. Once ready, you can begin your journey by heading out onto the C1 loop to look for races to defeat. This loop is based on a real section of highway in Tokyo that travels near the Tokyo Tower. While you can select the direction of the beltway you were going on, either outer or inner loop, it doesn't really affect what opponents you will be facing, and only marginally affects the layout of the road you'll be driving on. Once your night begins, you can see on the left side of the screen a map with a bunch of blue flashing dots. These dots are other racers, and you will need to eventually beat all of them. To challenge them, you'll need to get close behind them and flash your headlights. Now, the real fun of the game begins as Tokyo Extreme Racer showcases a unique racing style. Instead of trying to get far enough ahead or racing to a specific point, both you and your opponent instead have health bars, and the match goes on until only one has health left. The health bar decreases faster the further behind you are, ensuring that races are always intense. Whether you're trying to defeat a weaker opponent as fast as possible, or constantly trading positions with a particularly difficult boss. So how do you face these difficult bosses? Good question! When you challenge different racers, you will see different logos in the upper right side of the screen. Those indicate the different teams that your rivals belong to. Defeat every member of a particular team, and that team's leader will be the next to challenge you. Defeat enough team leaders, and you will end up facing a boss. In total, there are 8 bosses. 4 divas, and 4 devils. And all of them are terrifyingly quick, each with their own aggressive and fast driving style, heavily modified car, and strengths and weaknesses for you to exploit. Actually, that applies to every racer you come across in this game, as different teams feature different types of cars, levels of tune, and driver skill level. It definitely helps give the racers more variety. You could go from easily defeating a member of Rolling Guy in the Toyota AE86s to struggling against a member of Speedbox in the NSX in the same night. Plus, once you defeat a rival, additional information about them can be read in the rival's section back of the garage, making the racing scene feel much deeper and more lively than you'd initially guess. Once you've gotten your races in for that night, it's time to head back to your garage and use that newly found money to upgrade your car. With the exception of tires, exhaust, and visual modifications, all upgrades come in stages. In order to buy a higher stage part, you must first buy all the earlier stages first. Combine that with the fact that most upgrade prices scale with the initial price of the car, and this gets expensive fast. Because of this, slower vehicles quickly become outclassed with no way to rectify this. And as such, it's better to save up for one of the higher powered cars, like the Mazda RX-7 or one of the Skyline GTRs as soon as you can. It's a shame too, because there is a solid selection of recognizable tuner cars, each with their own unique visual upgrades, that end up going to waste because they aren't competitive. One other aspect that this game struggles with is progression. With most of the faster vehicles and all other performance upgrades already unlocked, the few vehicles that you do unlock later in the game are either less useful than those already unlocked, like the S15 Sylvia and S2000, or are only on par with what was available from the beginning, like the R34 GTR. The only vehicle that is significantly quicker than every other car is the Porsche 911, and that one is unlocked only after beating the main career mode, making it useless for the career mode. Also, remember the C1 loop I mentioned? That is the only stretch of highway you get to drive on for the entire game. Finally, this game struggles with the vehicle handling. When driven normally, nearly every car understeers like a boat, regardless of the settings used or the parts equipped. The only exception being the aforementioned Porsche 911 that you unlock after beating the game. This greatly dampens the enjoyment of what would otherwise be a fun game. One thing that I found that helps though, is to constantly be at full throttle and just excessively use the brakes to slow down the car and turn it through the turns. It feels counterintuitive, but that's how I manage to beat some of the later opponents. While this game does have a lot of really great aspects, including the graphics, the car roster, the racer variety, and the unique battle system, it also has flaws that ultimately break the core aspect of the gameplay. The unique battle system and rivals don't matter much when they aren't fun to race against due to the game's wonky handling. The massive vehicle roster ends up wasted because so few of the cars are even viable, and graphical fidelity alone does not make a good game. This is a game with extreme highs and extreme lows, and while I'd consider recommending it when the game initially came out for its ambitious innovations alone, the follow-up titles in this series do everything this game does even better, making this entry only worth playing for curiosity's sake. Hey y'all, I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, be sure to leave a like and subscribe as that helps out immensely. 
I had a lot of fun making this and I'm already in the process of writing up the script for the next video on a different Japanese racing game. Though this one is a bit more unconventional. 